We all have that one thing we hold near and dear to our heart. Some people have their loved ones, their family, their partner. Some people have their pets or their car. And then there's me. I have Team Fortress too. Okay, I may be exaggerating just a bit for the sake of an introduction, but TF2 really does hold a special place in my heart. I've explained on various occasions why, but today I'm here to talk about what drew me into the wild ride that's been my obsession for the past six years. If you frequent my streams, then you'll know that I have some serious problems with the state the game is in right now. I'm not afraid of complaining over and over, even if it's something I love, but this video is going to be a celebration of something great about TF2. Something that I think we can all agree on. The characters. Some people play TF2 for the refined high skill ceiling gameplay. Some are there for the economy, the game created via hats, and 1960s internet. But myself and many other people are there for the amazing characters and world Valve has managed to create over the 11 active years of the game's life. While I came to love TF2 for its gameplay, except melee, what initially sucked me in was the characters. I happened to come across Meet the Medic when it just came out by chance, and I was instantly hooked. I got a Steam account, downloaded the game, and proceeded to Battle Medic for 4 hours, and then didn't touch it again for a few months. I was new to the FPS genre, and I had never played one on the PC. Or should I say Mac, because I was confined to the family Mac at the time. So essentially, TF2 was a brand new type of game to me, and I loved it. I may not have been very good, and I could argue that I'm still not great at the game, but what matters is I was having fun. And along with the fun of the gameplay was the fun of the characters I heard spouting one-liners every few seconds, and I loved that even more. Chances are, even if someone isn't personally familiar with TF2, they probably still have the ability to identify one or two characters due to their frequent use on the internet as memes, in Gmod videos, or just randomly appearing in people's videos. Or honestly, just the comment section. If you frequent the internet, you're almost guaranteed to have seen at least one thing to do with TF2, and that's no shocker. TF2 has such a recognizable art style, that those who have tried to copy it haven't ever quite hit the same note. Aside from The Incredibles, who are based off the same art style and is made by Pixar. The mercenaries were so carefully designed. Each one is easily distinguishable from the other. Every single time someone brings up how important silhouettes are in a game, I guarantee you TF2 will be brought up, and usually it is the first and prime example used. Valve's goal was to make each one easily distinguishable from afar, and they did an amazing job at doing so. Even if you've just briefly seen each mercenary, if you are asked to identify each one through silhouettes, I guarantee you probably could. Let's even throw cosmetics into the mix. Even if you have a merc decked out in cosmetics, most of the time they're still going to be identifiable right off the bat. And that's because most cosmetics make sure to keep the general body shape of the mercenary the same. Even if it's something as radical as making Heavy visibly <laughs> strong with luscious yes! locks and booty shorts, this piece of Russian hunk is still identifiable as a Heavy because it keeps his core torso and body the same. Sure, his head silhouette changed due to the flowing locks he was given, but it's not enough to compromise his integral shape. Of course, there are exceptions to this. Cosmetics such as Halloween restricted ones are infamous for breaking the silhouette rule, and is generally why they're restricted. If you didn't know the character in cosmetics well, you probably wouldn't know what this mess of a character was. Although, the same thing applies from the heavy example. The main torso area is still kept mostly unchanged, and due to the stance, it can still be identifiable as Scout yeah. to those who are actually familiar with the game. While it's easy to gush about how great the mercenary silhouettes are while they're in simple A poses, what about in practice, in game? Are they functionally distinguishable? Of course they are! In fact, I just mentioned a key component to this. Each mercenary has a specific way in which they stand. For instance, Scout is hunched over, lower to the ground than most, and it makes logical sense due to his character and job. He's the speedy Boston boy whose job it is to get in, harass the enemy, and not get hit. So a hunched over posture that makes his hitbox smaller makes complete sense. On the other hand, we have Heavy, the closest thing this game gets to a tank class. He has, by far, the widest hitbox and stands upright, toting his minigun around. His upright posture shows how large this man is and makes him a better shield for his teammates to use him as. He's big, he's threatening, and he protects his team. Heavy's a stand-up guy. I could go on and on about how fantastic these silhouettes translated into the game, but I have other fish cakes to fry here, so let's move on. To continue with the flow of the mercenaries' designs, let's talk about, well, their physical designs. Because by god are they great! Just like the silhouettes, each one was carefully thought out to be distinguishable. Look at this man! Immediately, what's the first thing that comes to your mind is his job. 
probably something in the medical field, yeah? With that long, flowing white coat, those dorky glasses, and the fact that he literally has a medical cross on his shoulders. This man is clearly some form of medic. What about this guy? Looks like an American soldier, right? He's got that bucket helmet and army light clothing. Tuxedo terrorist, baseball boy, Bob the Builder, Outback Ranger Man, Pyromaniac, Demonstrations Black, and Large Man who's probably slow and beefy. Okay, those last few were probably a bit off, but you get the point. While people may not be able to exactly identify their job, they can still get a good idea. The fantastic designs also extend out to the supporting cast. What type of person do you see when you hear this being yelled at you? The bomb has almost reached the final terminus! <laughs> Yeah, I'd say that seems about right. Something that I personally enjoy about these designs are that because the designs are confined to the 1960s and below, this made a lot of their uniforms simple, which meant it was very easy to make costumes for a majority of these characters. This guy was by for one of the easiest cosplays that I've ever seen done. I don't think I even need to explain why, just look at him. A simple design for a simple boy. And simple isn't necessarily bad. Simple is often good in design, or at least nowadays it is. Simple can be recognizable. Some of the most recognizable characters in the world have simplistic designs when you really think about it. While cosplays aren't for everyone, I believe the accessibility to being able to dress up so easily as many of the characters allows people another way to express their love for the game. Personally, TF2 actually got me into cosplay. I really wanted to dress up as the medic, and I did. Very poorly. But I've improved since then. I've done various iterations of Scout, Sniper, and even Miss Pauling and Merasmus, and I've loved every minute of it. As an aside, if you've ever wanted to cosplay, I highly suggest starting with TF2. Characters like Engineer, Heavy, and Scout are all very easy to put together, and it's a great start for a novice with little to no sewing skills. Seriously, a majority of things can be bought at thrift stores. I literally put this Scout together in a single day. Even the more complex ones aren't the most difficult to put together in comparison to other costumes. But of course, a character's design isn't all there is. Their personality is a major proponent of their effectiveness and likability. Oh, don't be such a baby. Lips grow back? No, they don't. We finally made it to the section I've been itching to get my grubby hands on. The characters of the characters. To blatantly state it, the mercenaries are stereotypes. All of them. But, they are stereotypes done right that have had 11 years to develop and hundreds of character-filled voices, lines, shorts, comics, and even blog posts. The mercenaries aren't just one-note characters, they all have dynamic personalities. Are they all crazy? Oh yeah, they all are. But some are just better at hiding it than others. But being crazy isn't the sole defining trait for them. If God had wanted you to live, he would not have created me! Soldier is probably the closest to having his defining character trait be crazy, but he's crazy for America! And straight up, just a loon. Soldier is literally just a crazy, patriotic man who loves his country maybe a little too much. But with the soldier motif comes loyalty, and Soldier is loyal to his team and his friends. During the war comic, he was very reluctant in turning against his friend, the Red Demo Man. It was only until the administrator produced a fake recording of him insulting Soldier in the worst way he could be insulted, by calling him a civilian. Now, as time went on, Soldier seemed to get dumber and dumber. He didn't start it as dumb as he is now, but I think the writers kinda just rolled with it. And when the comics were introduced, they seemed determined to make Soldier the most comic relief character of the series. It's sort of like that thing where the longer a show goes on, the more exaggerated character traits become. Except, in Soldier's case, they actually explained his steadily decreasing, already low sanity on the single panel in the comic explaining that two fourths water was poisoned with lead. No! Medic's an easy one. He's a crazy German mad scientist doctor. That's an archetype and a half if I've ever seen one, and while he definitely falls under a stereotype and overused character, the medic has more to him than just that. He has that, but even more. What do you think of when you think of mad scientists? Probably someone who's killed for their experiments, maybe tried to bring back the dead, foregoes morals for the sake of science, insane, all that jazz? Well, the medic has done all that, but to the extreme. 
Due to the silly nature TF2 has been given, the medic has been allowed to steal a man's skeleton, abduct a man that tried to rob him and place his consciousness in a pumpkin, and stolen eight other souls that he used to bargain with the devil. The absurd tone of TF2 allowed Medic to be as insane and experimental as he is. Not only is he a mad scientist stereotype put to the extreme, but he has other qualities that don't line up with the definition of a mad scientist archetype. While the Medic is basically the perfect description of one, he has been shown to actually care for people and doves, but not in a way that defies his mad scientist archetype. Especially doves, but who doesn't love Archimedes? He brought Sniper back to life after the TFC team killed him because he was a former teammate and friend, although he did state it was partially an attempt at defying modern medical science, which would allow his actions to fall in line with his stereotype while also adding another layer to his personality. What dreams of chronic can sustain? Now, as time went on, Pyro went from being this menacing mask pyromaniac to... Well, still a pyromaniac, but with childlike tendencies and a disturbed mind that I don't think anyone could have predicted. Pyro's essentially a grown kid that loves fire and isn't afraid to murder those who don't. They took what was a big mysterious character to making them even more mysterious and unknown by just flipping any expectations upside down. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to discuss on Pyro's character because he's basically just that mysterious mask person that we have no idea who's under the mask sort of thing. Demo Man started off as a drunk Scottish Cyclops and stayed a drunk Scottish Cyclops, but one that works his ass off for his mother and is an expert in his field. While I personally dislike that they basically made him a chronic alcoholic, he has been shown to still be fully functional when the situation calls for it. Is dedicated to his job, and his alcoholic nature has been used for some of the most outlandish jokes in the comics. He does his job, and he does his job pretty damn well along with two others that we don't know about. Demo is sort of neglected in his character department. His two big breaks were his Meet the Team videos and the War Update. War showed us his hesitation in killing his friend for a stash of weapons, but ultimately he decided to do so and required much less convincing than Soldier. However, there are some unused lines in the game that may hint towards Demo and Soldier keeping their friendship past War. However, I'm unsure of if these were added before the update as in a way to hint towards it or during the update, so do take this statement with a grain of salt. Yo, what's up? Now we've got a loud mouthed narcissistic Boston boy who's managed to get a lot of screen time from Valve in recent years. Egotistical till the end, Scout is always ready to show off and mouth about his existent and non-existent skills, even when he's on his deathbed. His ego actually makes sense when you know where he came from. Scout was the youngest of eight boys and growing up, was unable to keep up and make his way to fights before his brothers ended it. So he figured he didn't need to be the strongest but the fastest in order to beat them there. The youngest of a large family able to beat all of his brothers to fights and infights would really boost a kid's ego too much. Due to his egotism, Scout gets very defensive about himself, especially if it's an area he lacks any ability in or just straight up denies. As an aside, Scout's always been shown to be a fairly gifted drawer, as seen in his antics during expiration date, which I will be mentioning a lot through this because that 15 minute short does wonders for the characters. Oh, I see ya. Thanks for standing still, wanker. A far cry from the loud and often annoying Bostonian, we have the quiet man with the sexy voice, the Sniper. Sniper prides himself in his professionalism and skill. Of all the mercenaries, he is the least likely to dick around during his job. He's an efficiency machine and is best seen doing this in his Meet the Team video as well as this section in The Naked and the Dead. That also goes into a small description of how he depicts his job and how he does it. Arguably the most serious member of his team, save for the fact he literally fights with jars of piss, Sniper isn't seen talking as frequently as most of his other teammates and is often in the background away from the action or conversation, which falls in line with his profession. In expiration date, he's just sort of there in the background with his ghost watch and doesn't say a word, but comes and helps fight the bread monster when it starts wreaking havoc on the base. He literally saves Scout with a shot that four years later still impresses the hell out of me and really shows his sharp shooting skills. His reserved personality may make him seem like he's emotionless and detached, but to some extent he has to be. 
as he describes his own job, snipers just have to take the shot and not think about anything else. However, he's not void of emotion in the slightest. The best example of this is when he meets his real parents in the sunken New Zealand. The man is visibly happy and relieved that he's finally wrapped up the mystery he had been looking into for the past few months and really his entire life. Engineer is a fascinating case in my opinion. He comes off as the most sane of the mercenaries, but that doesn't mean he doesn't harbor some insanity in his personality. He's got the standard humble and respectful southern personality on the outside that he shows to his co-workers and publicly. But if he's pushed too far, he will snap and put down what may just be a facade. I've always found the engineer's general character to be more of a reverse stereotype. Usually southerners are stereotyped into being dumb, but we know the proud Texan Del Conagher is the complete opposite of it. While he, again, has the kind southern personality, I'm honestly convinced a lot of the time he just puts a face on. Taken from someone who lives in the south, very frequently this sort of demeanor is faked. Behind his respectful persona is a man who lives for inventing and constantly improving things. Keep in mind, this man sawed off his forearm in order to use the gunslinger. I don't think a man that does that is going to be all there in the head. Additionally, like Medic, several voice lines suggest sadistic behavior and a bit of a god complex, and honestly how could you blame him considering the man has 11 PhDs and can effectively fix and improve life extender machines. He's brilliant. Spy's always been pretty consistent with his personality. The suave man of mystery that constantly makes snide remarks to both his enemies and his teammates, constantly condescending and feeling he's above everyone else, but if you look into his action, you'll see he does actually care. He just does his best to cover it up. The biggest example of this is an expiration date. Just take a minute to really think of all he does in that short. Once the team finds out they have 72 hours to live, he's the one that organizes the meeting for all of them to discuss their dying wishes. He goes into it with a rousing speech to boost the morale and mood of his teammates, and is visibly pleased right before he finds out Scout ruined the whole thing. Even though Scout ruined the bucket idea, he still decides to spend his last hours of his life helping him get a date with Miss Pauling. Really think about that. He spent what he believed to be the last two days of his life helping the boy who constantly mocked him for his gentlemanliness. Granted, we now know he's Scout's father thanks to the comics, but that doesn't really change much. If he really didn't care about Scout or his teammates, he wouldn't have done what he did in Expiration Date. Speaking of the reveal, or more so the confirmation of Spy being Scout's father, his Tom Jones disguise allowed him to drop his usual uppity attitude and really tell Scout how he felt, how proud he was of him. While I believe he cared way more for Scout than he let on, I mean just look at the expression on his Tom Jones disguise, I don't believe that this meant Scout didn't irritate him at all. Scout irritates everyone and Spy is certainly no exception. Heavy is a man with big gun. Heavy is strong and stoic Russian man. Heavy will crush little baby man. Heavy actually really cares about his family. Throughout most of TF2's life, Heavy was depicted as just this guy who was strong, couldn't speak English that well, and had a love of cold cut meats. A lot of people use him as a big joke and interpret him as a dumb, silly Russian who likes to eat. But if you actually listen to some of his voice line, this man is a killer of men. He takes immense pleasure at mowing people down with his beloved Sasha, to the point where yeah, it can make him look silly, but it's just his way of having fun. A majority of his voice lines are a bit of a far cry in personality when compared to his appearance in other media, specifically the comics and that's because of the change of setting. When in game, Heavy is doing what he loves, he's doing what's fun and exciting to him, so his voice lines are going to reflect it. In the comics, he's much more reserved due to the fact that he's not currently working for an endless war as a mercenary in the middle of a battle. Even after he leaves to join the reunited team, he's still not as jovial as he appears in the game, because a majority of the time he's just along with Scout, the merc with a mouth, who very visibly annoys him and speaks more than enough for both of them. He doesn't really start acting like he does in the games until The Naked and the Dead, when he's given Sasha back to fight the robots, but even that's pretty short-lived because he has to duel off with the TFC Heavy, who ends up killing Medic and kind of really pissing the big Russian man off. 
Now, I've always found the mercenaries' dynamic personalities allowed for a myriad of different interpretations without compromising their character. In my early years of playing and obsessing over this game, I unfortunately admit that I was one of those weirdos who read a lot of fanfiction. Legitimately, I had never read fanfiction until TF2 came around because I had never really cared to see more antics of any other characters from any other place. But when I got into TF2, I wanted to see, or rather read more, of what they could get into, and since I had gone through every bit of information Valve had given us, I craved more, even if it wasn't from official writers. Now, of course, fanfiction is a place in a fandom where you have to tread lightly and a part that people look to and discuss. There is going to be some weird ones. Jordan, still on the moon, fired all the missiles at the Earth. It was an accident, but it destroyed most of the world and killed all but 18 men and one woman in New Mexico. And the men, slightly disoriented by the missiles from the moon, continued to fight each other in teams of nine. One was called Red and the other was called Blue. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> that's the title of the That's the canon backstory for TF2. That doesn't mean they're all bad. Some authors really put their all into keeping the integrity of the characters and world intact through their stories. I seem to have skewed away from my original point though, which is that it's hard to write the characters completely wrong. What I mean is that because their personalities are broad and have different quirks to them, many people interpret them with a slightly higher exaggeration in one quirk than the other, and that wouldn't be completely wrong. What's hard though is getting a balance between each character's personalities, and I think that's a good thing. I'm no professional writer. Hell, if you've seen my tweets, you know I can't even get grammar and wording right nowadays. But I still believe this is part of what makes a character's personality good, by having so many different aspects that writers can play around with. While I've been saying different interpretations of a merc can still be right when compared to one another, they also aren't completely perfect and oftentimes can exaggerate part of a personality too much. I believe in the past few years Valve has even had problems doing this, particularly with Soldier. As mentioned before, he's just continuously losing points from his probably already low IQ. As much as I love Soldier, he's basically been demoted to being the comic relief character that says and does random things. And part of me believes they came up with lead poison water as an excuse for how far gone Soldier was. These amazing characters, their brilliant and simplistic designs, their personalities, their little mannerisms are what kept me coming back to TF2 and why I've never stopped playing or caring about it. I might often complain about the state the game is in and the neglect Valve is essentially forcing onto it, but it's because I'm worried. I'm worried we won't continue seeing new things from this wonderfully asinine world we've had the pleasure of partaking in for 11 years. I'm worried it will be thrown to the side for some new, more profitable way for Valve to make money. Don't get me wrong, I'm certain TF2 makes a ton of money th for them through the Steam Market and the Manco store, but it probably doesn't make as much as it used to because it's not the hot new thing. I personally believe it'll take a lot, or more so, a lot of nothing, to fully kill off TF2. The community based around this game is big and dedicated. They've made some absolutely amazing things, and heck, some people have made livings off of getting their workshop items into the game. Even if official game servers go down, there will always be community servers to keep the game going. I don't believe TF2 is dying, but I do believe if we continue to receive updates at the rate we've been getting in the past three years, we may not have these amazing characters to entertain us much longer. Well, I didn't mean to end on a depressing note, but oops, I guess I accidentally did. Anyhow, if you watched this far, thank you so much for sticking it out towards the end. I know this was a long video. This was something I had wanted to tackle for a long time, but I wanted to make it an extensive, in-depth, and comprehensive look into why I believe these characters are so great. I hope you guys enjoyed this as the 100,000 subscriber special. I know it's not the wackiest thing to celebrate with, but it's something I really poured my heart and effort into, and I hope it'll do. Anyhow, this outro and video has gone on way too long. I hope to see you guys next time.